Johnston made gestures indicating he wanted Sewell to leave the party. Dykes trotted in to find out what Sewell had done to warrant expulsion. Being the manager, Dykes thought he was entitled to information, but all he heard from the arrogant gentleman in blue was, ask the American League office, end quote. The quotation in yesterday's story said that all the articles Mr. Harwich had seen were very unfair. Maybe if the quotation was correct, we didn't see that one, because nothing I said was less fair than the above, and I believe I was probably the most, well, at least among the most outspoken of the announcers, although I may be wrong in that. Incidentally, the other two Sunday writers uh, reported the incident respectively as follows. One said, quoting, however, the defeat was placed up by some violent protest by Messrs. Luke Sewell and Skipper Jimmy Dykes the Sox. The other one also referred to violent gestures, and both men mentioned to swing to saving of the umpire from violence by the police squad. Now, most baseball fans can read. Being able to read, they don't need radio announcers to point out the violence of what happened or would involve. Anytime a newspaper mentions a police squad and so forth in connection with an umpire, that umpire is going to get it from next day from the fans, radio and no. Some of the worst pop bottle episodes in the history of the game came either before the days of radio or without radio's aid. Sunday's incident was hardly the worst that ever occurred in the league. And uh, those other two stories, I hardly think they can be pointed out as exceptional jobs of reporting. Everyone in the park knows that the ejection of Sewell and Dykes came with neither man making a demonstration of any sort until after they'd been ordered from the game. I do know that my account was accurate at least. Summing it up, I said at the beginning of this comment, I bring it up again only because a serious charge has been placed unfairly at our door. To let it stand without comment would be a cowardly thing. So I've given you the charges, the newspaper angle, and I'll report briefly what I said. If I saw Bart Johnson motion Sewell out of the game for making a harmless gesture of hopeless despair, and when I saw him immediately point Dykes to the bench as he walked slowly and quietly toward him without making so much of the gesture, I declared that if the umpire really had ejected these two important men in such vital series for so trivial a reason, he didn't rate as a major league umpire. That was meant as a reflection on no one else but the umpire, which I believe is obvious. We're told to report the game as we feel. Perhaps there's an intimation that we make no personal comments, yet similar to those that I uttered, made by the writers in a call today. I am the few fan, as I leave it as a regular announcer, I deny responsibility for Sunday's episode in any greater degree than anyone else. If we were responsible to any extent, I'm being stopped. And as to my opinion of anyone throwing missiles onto a ball field, anyone who heard me Sunday knows my sentiments, which are not complimentary and not in all my Radcliffe left, 
Rosenthal center. Krivich right. Vanura first. Appling short. Winter Hayes second. Fyatt third. Sewell catching. And Kane pitching. And the umpires will be Quinn behind the plate and McGowan on the bases. Now I imagine the umpires will be out here. In fact, I see them coming along out here right now, which means the ball game will be underway very shortly. And so in order that we get our little chores and few things, including the scores taken care of downtown, why we'll do a little return to the studio. Because the chassis parts of your car are out of sight, all too often they're out of mind. But if you could look under your car as you drive along to see the mile after mile pounding these vital parts you see, you give these vital chassis parts the best lubrication you can get. So drive into the nearest Texaco station and ask for a Marvac job. Marvac is the scientifically applied Texaco chassis lubricant that lasts twice as long as old-fashioned grease. It's used by the largest bus companies and airlines in the country because it lubricates better and for a longer time. Marvac is a top lubricant with a strong lubricating film that won't break down under the hammering impacts of hard, fast driving. It guards your car against chassis repairs and the loosening up that quickly depreciates its value. Marvac adds to your riding enjoyment. Don't drive a noisy, expensive to operate car. Tomorrow is your Texaco dealer for a Marvac job. You'll drive out a quieter, easier handling car. A car that you'll find safer and more economical to run. And now, while we're waiting for the baseball game to start, we'll give you the schedule of the other games to be played in both leagues this afternoon. In the National League, in New York, the Cubs are playing the Giants this afternoon, and the game is already in the first half of the third inning. At the end of the first half of the third, the Giants lead the Cubs one to nothing. Lee and Hartnett are working for the Cubs. Gabler and Mancuso for the Giants. The doubleheader baseball game in Philadelphia between the Phils and the Cincinnati Reds have been postponed. Both, both games are postponed because of wet ground. In Brooklyn, the St. Louis Cardinals play a doubleheader ball game against the Dodgers. At the end of the first half of the seventh inning, the Dodgers are leading the Cardinals by a score of 13 to 4. Marvin and Davis working for the Cards. Longo and Berries starting for the Dodgers with Baker pitching in the seventh. The first game of the Twinville in Boston between the Bees and the Pirates was taken by the Bees 4 to 1. Swift and Patton worked for the Pirates with Welch pitching in the eighth. McFaith and Lopez, the battery for the Bees all the way. The Bees won the first game 4 to 1. In the second game, the batteries for the Pirates, Weaver and Patton, for the Bees, Smith and Mueller. Now over to the American League. In St. Louis, the Browns take on the Boston Red Sox this afternoon. The game starting at 4 o'clock. In Detroit, the Tigers play another game with the New York Yankees. The warm-up pitchers for the Yankees, Ruffing. For the Tigers, Sullivan. In Cleveland, the Indians play a doubleheader ball game with the Washington Senators. At the end of the first half of the fourth inning, the Indians are leading the Senators 8-5. to five. Cohen and Millie started for the Senators with Appleton pitching in the third, and the Indians starting Lee and Pitlack with Hildebrand taking over the mound duties in the third. And now for a look at the standing of the Cubs in both leagues. In the National League, the Chicago Cubs are still in first place. They've played 91 games, of which they've won 57 and lost 34. Second place, St. Louis Cardinals, two and a half games behind. Third place, New York Giants, whom the Cubs are playing today in New York. They're in third place, eight games behind. Fourth place, Pittsburgh Pirates, ten full games behind. Fifth, Cincinnati Reds, 12 games behind. Sixth, Boston Bees, 14 games behind. And in seventh, Philadelphia Phillies, 21 and a half games behind. And in eighth place, the Brooklyn Dodgers, 24 games behind. In the American League, the New York Yankees are in first place. They've played 96 games, of which they've won 63, lost 33. Second, Cleveland Indians, nine games behind. Third, Boston Red Sox, ten and a half games behind. Fourth, Detroit Tigers, twelve and a half games behind. And the Chicago White Sox are in fifth place, thirteen games behind the New York Yankees. And now I see that Hal Totten is ready, and we'll go back to Comiskey Park to the baseball game brought to you by permission of the Chicago White Sox and the Philadelphia Athletics to stimulate interest in our national game and in your local team. Take it, Hal Totten. Good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen, from the ballpark and the 
Athletic's first hitter, Finney, is already up there at the plate waiting to hit. The only trouble is that there's no White Sox on the field. They really good. There they come out of the dugout. And on their way out, Kreevich started out, and Luke Appley grabbed him by the neck and pivoted around him to run out to his position. And the Sox boys trot out on the field with Sugar King walking out to finish his warm-up on the mound with Luke Sewell. Kane has been absolute murder to this Philadelphia club. Ever since he left them with St. Louis, he beat them continually, and he's done it with White Sox, except that the other day when they were hitting everything everybody threw anyway, he couldn't stop them after Mr. Evans started getting his ticket to Kansas City. The, uh, yeah, that ticket was well punched. Did I tell you what Red, Red uh, on many of us, I come, he went downstairs after the game, he was already on his way up the office to get his transportation. He took it good-naturedly, he knows he'll be back. He, he looked up at me and he said, hey, hell, and I said, well, hello, Red, he says, boom, 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 <laughs> boy, <laughs> boom, boom, all he heard was face hit, but he can do that's all he heard. Well, we're almost ready to go now, the Sox infield starts to talk it up. As he finishes his warm-up, the ball goes out to second. Have a nice, cute little arrangement this afternoon. I don't know whether the official scorer is still going to refuse to pass the word along to the radio announcer, so the radio announcer's had an election, and I'm elected the radio official scorer. How do you like this? <laughs> well, I don't have to score anything on that one, because Vinny, as he did two days ago, started on the first pitch and drove it hard out in the left center for a base hit, just in a good spot right between the outfielders and lets him get the second base. That's the third day in a row in which Finney has gone after the first pitch and the second in a row three times that he's driven it out for a base hit. A double to left center by Finney, putting him on second base, with nobody out in the first inning for the outfitted, and Moses, well, Wally Moses is up there at the plate. Another left-handed hitter and a dangerous one, very fast man, and the A center fielder, Kane, looks around rather surprisingly at the runner on second base, now gets ready to pitch. Throws, and Moses blitz the ball perfectly, but oh, it rolls foul. The left of the plate started out like a perfect bunt, rolling along towards third base just far enough so that they were, he had a very good chance of even beating it out, although they were playing for a bunt, because he's very, very fast. But the ball rolled foul, and it's strike one on Moses. One strike to count. Kane out there gets his sign again. He's ready to pitch, puts back to second, and throws. And the hitter, oh, it was as though he wanted to bunt again, but the pitch was high and wide. He let it go by for ball one. The count is one and one. One ball and one strike on Moses. One and one the count. Kane throws again, and ball two misses the outside corner down around the knees. And it's two and one. Two balls and one strike. Stretches, look back at second base, throws a gun, and the hitter got the third ball. It also missed the outside corner down around the knees, and it's three balls and one strike on Moses. Three and one to count. Three and one is the count. She throws a gun, and the hitter takes ball four. It's inside and low, and he got the base on ball. And now the A's are starting out as they did the day before yesterday by very, very dangerous out here. King walks slowly in toward the plate talking to umpire Quinn. I don't think he's, he's talking a little bit, but I don't think he's really objecting to those decisions because every pitch there looked like a bad ball. And so the A's have runners on first and second with nobody out. And Chubb Dean, the first baseman, a dangerous hitter, left-handed hitter, is up there at the plate. get settled in the mound. They certainly expect to bump this time. And Dean reaches out and bumps the ball perfectly. Flash comes in, gets it, throws the first base. And Venora, facing back, shifts across the back and takes the throw. Perfect sacrifice by Dean. The play going from Flat to Venora for the first out in the first inning, moving Finney to third base and Moses to second. So the A's have runners on second and third with one out of the first inning. And George Puccinelli, big boots, Husky right-handed hitter he is up there at the plate. Richard Dodge is wind up. 
throws and the hitter takes it inside and low for ball one. One ball called. Ready again, throws, and it's ball two. Well, Shug's having trouble getting that ball over the plate today. That makes it two and nothing, two balls and no strikes on Puccinelli. Two and nothing. And there's the third ball. It missed the inside corner across the waist to make it three balls and no strikes. How do you like that whistle, George? Isn't that cute? Fans might wonder what that whistle is. Well, that's the wind blowing through the slats. These boards in the rear of the grandstand. After it sings all sorts of keys. There's the fourth ball high and wide. Pooch got the base on balls. And the A's have the bases full with only one man out of the first inning. And Bob Johnson, the second baseman, is at bat. Johnson up there at the plate. Tosses one bat aside. Another right-handed hitter and a dangerous one. Winds up to pick the first one to him. Throws, and the hitter takes it inside and low for ball one. One ball calls. It's ready out there again. Winds up, pitches, and it's a strike. Finally got one in there. A strike over the heart of the plate, waist high in the count. He is one and one. One ball and one strike. up again. Throws and Johnson swings it a high fly to right field. Pivich is waiting back there under it. Follows it over as the wind carries it toward the foul line. Makes the catch and starts the ball toward the plate. Benora cuts it off. Throws to second and the runner is out sliding in there but the run from third base had already scored. Run from third base had already scored. It goes as a double play from Pivich to Benora to Appling. Pivich to Benora to Appling. But not until Benny had already scored on Johnson's fly to feet. So it's one run in the first inning for the A's. One run, one hit, and one man left on me. A 
Crawford happens to be one first-year man that has shown throw no signs of being very much of a weakling out there. He's been very, very good. He throws the first one, and Rosenthal gets a good strike over the inside corner down around the knee. One strike on Larry. And the pitcher winds up again. Throws. And it's a curveball wide and low for ball one, making the count one ball and one strike on Rosenthal. Hitting for the White Sox with one out of the first inning. Again, the pitcher throws Larry Swings in an easy bounder down to Johnson, who fumbles it, recovers it, throws the first, and the runner is safe. And it's an error by Johnson. An error by Johnson. It's Rosenthal on first base with one out in the first inning. And Mike Kredich, the right fielder, is at bat. Kredich up there at the plate. Right-handed hitter, stocky little chap. Looks at first base and throws, and Mike takes a wide one across the knees for ball one. One ball call. Ready again, takes another look at first throws, and Mike swings the line and ball down the right field line, back into the seat, and it's one and one. One ball and one strike. Yesterday. The 
first pitch is a strike. Here comes the next pitch for strike two, and there's two strikes on Piggy Higgins. He swings the next hit a ball on the ground back to the left of the plate, and it's Joel, two strikes on Piggy Higgins, the athletic third baseman. That's start the second inning. Stands out there massaging that ball pretty carefully. Finally swings around, steps on the slab, starts to wind up. And throws and hit a swing to hit a high fly out in the short left center. Rosenthal's jogging in easily. And uh, Appling circles out there to make the catch. So Rosenthal and Radcliffe were jogging in, but Appling was out there to make the catch easily. And it's one out of the second and win today. Very, very strong, as you can tell by that whistle that you hear of the wind blowing through the boards in the back of the second deck here. And it's blowing from the north, slightly northeast, blowing right back toward the plate. One out of the second inning for the athletics and Frankie Hayes, the A's catcher. Hey, they're playing the scale now. <laughs> up there at the plate with one out of the second inning. Start to wind up pitches, and Frank takes a curveball wide for ball one. One ball called. Pitch again is winding up. He throws, and Frank takes a wide one across the knees for ball two. So it's two and nothing, two balls and no strikes on Frank Hayes. Got the ball over well for Higgins, but he's having a little trouble getting it over for Frank. Ready again, throws, hit a swing, hit a bounder out into left field for a base hit, and went out between Platt and Appling, pretty well hit, and it's a base hit. Putting Hayes on first base, with one out of the second inning, and Newsom, Whitey Newsom, the A shortstop, is up there at the plate. Newsom at bat. Take a look over there first. Look at the plate. Up on the ball, tried to punch it to right, but he fouled it over against the stand of the right of the plate. And it's one strike on Newsom. One strike to count. Dane again stands there beside that new ball with his bare hands, get that shine off, get it so he can hold it and control it. First and pitches, and the hitter takes it inside across the waist for ball one. Count is one and one. One ball and one strike on Newsom. One and one to count. And there's ball two, a high fastball outside, making it two and one. Two balls and one strike on Lamar Newsom, known as Whitey. The A's shortstop. That was one out of the second inning. And he's on first base. He throws again, and Newsom hits one out in the left center, a little looping fly, and it drops in there for a little Texaco leaguer. That's it, gets the ball fast, throws it to second base. The Alphabetics have runners on first and second, with one out in the second inning. And Fink, Herman Fink, the athletic pitcher, is up there at the plate. He's a right-handed pitcher, and I also notice now he bats right-handed. Walks slowly up there, stops to rub dust over his hands. And then steps up to the plate. And there's the first pitch inside and low for ball one. One ball call. Ready out there again. Pitch looks back at second pitch. The hitter hits a line drive out to Jackie Hayes. Who turns and throws to Benora at first base. It's another double play. The ball was very well hit. Hayes leaped far to his left, grabbed it on the line, and then with both runners having been on the goal, as soon as the hitter swung, apparently he's a hit and run play on it. Fink must be a better hitter than a lot of pitchers. He neither runner had a chance to get back to his base, and it was easy for Hayes to throw to Benora at first, doubling Newsom for the third out. So it's no runs, two hits. One man left on base for the first half of the second inning. And the score remains one to nothing in 
favor of the athletics as the White Sox come to bat in the last half of the seventh of the second mm-hmm. in this ball game over at bat. And Appling, Luke Appling will be the first man at bat. I think he's already there warming up, and Appling stands at plate watching. Boy, what an ideal day for just being out in the air and getting a lot of sunshine this is. Moss, the reserve catcher, down there warming up the pitcher, but uh, now the other pitcher comes walking out of the dugout and almost up to the plate. Moss going to take another warm-up throw. Finally throws the ball out to second base, where the second base and the shortstop are standing alongside the bag. Johnson got the juggle dip and flipped it backhanded to Newsom. He returns it to pitcher, and now the East Door men back to their positions, backing up and talking to each other as they go, as Mink takes his place on the mound, and Luke Appling steps up to bat. Appling at bat, start the second inning, and the score one to nothing in favor of the Athletics. a double or a triple wind-up. I don't know which, so Luke swings, hits a long, high fly to left field, but it looks easy for Finney. He's jogging over toward the foul line and makes the catch easily for the first out of the second inning. One out of the second inning for the White Sox, and the Jackie Hayes, the White Sox second baseman, is at bat. Jackie swings, hit a ball out in the center field. Looks like an easy fly. Center fielder jogging in under it and makes the catch without any trouble for the second up. He's just letting the boys hit that ball into the air and with the wind holding it up the way it is, almost always somebody can get under it. That makes it two out of the second inning for the Sox. And Tony Plant, White Sox, third baseman, while Jimmy Dykes is taking this little rest down there, is up there at the plate. Plant at that. She winds up. Throws, and it's a fast one that misses the inside corner about waist high for ball one. One ball called. He looks around the boys to field and gets ready again. Busy time. Starts to wind up. Pitches and the hitter takes a strike over the outside corner, letter high, and it's one ball and one strike on fire. One and one. And there's ball two wide and low, and it's two balls and one strike. He's throwing a lot of slow stuff at Tony, trying to make him go after that change of pace. So it's two balls and one strike on Pyatt. Think winding up again. Pitches and the hitter swings and misses a slow curve that time for strike two. Looks very funny going around on that one because with almost no swing at all. He just so completely missed the ball. He was trying to stop up, but too late. So it's two on two. Two balls and two strikes. I think goes again and five leans back. He got the third ball inside. And it's three balls and two strikes on 25. Three and two is the count. comes the fourth ball. It's over the plate, but too low, and Platt got the base on ball. So Luke Sula was standing down there waiting, takes off the shin guard, which he was still wearing, and walks up the plate. Dodger Hayes walks out into the infield to talk to Pink, turns around, starts back behind the plate. Stolen base. And 
Puts him on second base with two out in the second inning. And Luke Sewell still at bat. Count now of two balls and no strikes. Good nothing on Sewell. Billy Webb talking it up down there plenty. Trying to get the boys to get things moving. Things pitches and Luke fouls this one out of the roof of the stand above and to the right of the plate for strike one. The count is two balls and one strike on Sewell. One the count. He looks back at second base and throws again and Sewell swings. The pop fly coming down. Foul out near first base. The catcher follows over there and makes the catch almost down to the visiting dugout for the third out. So it's no run, no hit. One man left on base in the second inning for the White Sox. And at the end of the second inning, Athletics still lead the White Sox by a score of one to nothing. May we remind you again that the offer is still open of the 1936 Texaco scorebook. People that haven't obtained it or have obtained one and have it practically filled, better get your request card in for another one. This attractive book contains not only the complete layout of pictures of the White Sox and the Cubs, their rosters and league schedules, but a complete scoring system, the same one we've used in the press box for many, many years, with illustrations and explanations of how to work it, examples of it, and the official scoring blanks, the same as we've also used up here for many, many years, in fact, since the start of the game, practically, for 17 full games. So to get this book, all you have to do is stop in at any Texaco station, fill it in with your name and address, put a one-cent stamp on it, and mail it, and that scorebook will be sent to you. We're ready to go now in the third inning with Luke Finney, the Philadelphia left fielder, leadoff man at bat. A call time for a moment while Jackie Hayes goes over at first with Luke Applick's assistant and now alone is fastening that second base down a little tighter, seem to be getting a little loose. Now the boys are back in position and... Vinny, who opened the game with a double on the first pitch and eventually scored the lone run so far, is up there taking the first pitch for a strike over the outside corner of Alton Neha. One strike is the count. She winds up again, throws and hit her swing, hit her high fly out into left center. Rosenthal's waiting for it out there, makes the catch, and it's one out of the third inning. One out of the third inning for the Athletics. And Moses, Wally Moses, the center fielder, is at bat. to wind up the pitch, the first one to Wally throws, and the hitter swings in about her back past the pitcher, Appling comes over, grabs it on a hard try, and fumbles it, but the runner is safe. And I think, what do you think on that, George? Well, we'll give him a base hit on it. Give him a base hit, because he had to go over fast, near second base to get it, and uh, then fumbled it on a tough try out there. He was a hard one, because he had to go a long ways to get it, and reaching on the dead run for a ball, taking a bad hop, it got away from him and goes as a scratch hit, says the radio official scorer today. It hits the next one for a high foul going into the stands back and drives the plate. Goes up on the roof of the stands above third base. And it's strike one. One strike on Dean. Moses on first base with one out of the third inning for the athletic. And the pitcher waits there again. Kane has his time. He pitches and Dean swings and misses for strike two. Swung well around on that ball. Umpire McGowan in that very careful way he has a studying place. Thought a second. Take a look at where that bat was and then called it a strike or waved it a strike. He may have called it before that. But he got out where he could see how far he swung. And now the hitter hits the next one into left field for a base hit. Ball went out there fast on the ground. Between Pyatt and Appling for a base hit into left field by Dean, moving Moses to second base. And the Athletics have runners on first and second again with one out in the third inning. And Puccinelli, George Puccinelli, the right fielder, is up there to play. Here's the first one right back at the pitcher who throws it clear in the center field. And the runner for second is round at third and is coming home. The ball is coming in there at the plate, but he scores and still cuts the throw off. And they get the runner. I Now they missed him going into second base. He got in there safely. Error on the throw. Error on the throw. Back at second base by Kane. He should have had the third double play in three. And he 
throw, but he threw the ball behind Naplin as he was dashing over to the base instead of in front of him, and it went clear in the center field for very bad error on what should have been an easy double play to end the inning, and as a result, another run scores, and the runners are on second and third. Up, throws the first one at Johnson who takes it inside and low for ball one. So winds up again, pitches, and it's a high one inside. Give him a base hit because he had to go over fast. Near second base to get it. And uh, then fumbled it on a tough try out there. He was a hard one because he had to go a long way to get it. And reaching on a dead run for a ball, taking a bad hop. It got away from him. It goes as a scratch hit, says the radio official scorer today. It hits the next one for a high ball going into the stands. Back and drive the plate. Goes up on the roof of the stands above third base. And it's strike one. One strike on Dean. Moses on first base with one out of the third inning for the Athletic. And the pitcher waits there again. Kane has his time. He pitches and Dean swings and misses for strike two. Swung well around on that ball. Umpire McGowan in that very careful way he has a studying place. Throw it a second. Take a look at where that bat was and then called it a strike or waved it a strike. He may have called it before that. But he got out where he could see how far he swung. And now the hitter hits the next one into left field for a base hit. Ball went out there fast on the ground between Hyatt and Epling for a base hit into left field by Dean, moving Moses to second base. And the Athletics have runners on first and second again with one out in the third inning. And Puccinelli, George Puccinelli, the right fielder, is up there to play. Throws it clear in the center field, and the runner from second is round at third and is coming home. The ball is coming in there at the plate, but he scores and still cuts the throw off, and they get the runner. I've, no, they missed him going into second base. He got in there safely. There on the throw. There on the throw. Back at second base by Kane. He should have had the third double play in three innings there. If he made any kind of a throw, but he threw the ball behind that plane as he was dashing over to the base instead of in front of him, and it went clear in the center field for very bad error on what should have been an easy double play to end the inning, and as a result, another run scores, and the runners are on second and third. Now Kane winds up, throws the first one at Johnson, who takes it inside and blow for ball one. And it's a high one inside for the second ball, making it two or nothing. Two balls and no strikes on Johnson. Kane waiting out there again for the sign. Starts to wind up. Pitches and Johnson gets the third ball inside. He doesn't seem to want to take a chance on him. He'd rather fill that base out there with this man that gave him anything good to hit at. Well, he won't walk him on purpose. He'd rather do that. There's the next one, the fourth one. They really do throw wide on purpose. And it gives Johnson a base on balls, which fills the base for the athletic in the third inning. One out, one run home. He's now leading the White Sox by a score of two to nothing. And Higgins, Pinky Higgins, the athletic third baseman is a bat. Another right-handed hitter and a dangerous one. Hits the first one to Potter down to Pine, who grabs it, runs over and starts to roll and throws the ball clear over against the stand after Mickey finally making up his mind of what to do. One run scores, the other runner two runs score, and the other runners get the second and third. Pine got that ball, started to uh, run over to get it, and uh, I would call two errors on that. An error on the fumble, which let the man get the two first, Let's see, would that be right? Yeah, an error on the fumble and then an error on the throw. Two errors 
fumbling error and a throwing error, both on plant, which scores two runs and leaves runners on second and third. With only one out in the third inning, and Frank Hayes at bat. Winds up, throws the first one, and the hitter swings, hit a high fly into center field. Center fielder Rosenthal's waiting back there for it. He's under it, he has it, and the runner from third is going home easily after the catch with the fourth run of the inning. Fyatt was very peculiar on that play. He got the ball and seemed undecided what play to make. He started to run over to third base to get the man there, and then the man ran right in front of him. He started to tag him, and finally made up his mind to throw to first, and the runner was already at first, and the throw went clear over Venora's head, and that runner got the second base, and two runs scored on it. That now, Newsom swings hard at the first pitch and misses it for strike one. Back at second again, pitches and the hitter swings in another fly in the center field. Rosenthal starts in, backs up, and then does come in and make the catch easily for the third up. And one of the worthiest innings of the year, or half innings of the year, is over with in a great big hurry. Four runs, two hits, three errors, and one man left on base in the first half of the third inning, and the score is five to nothing in favor of the Athletics as the White Sox come to bat in the last half of the third with Keane, the pitcher, due to be the first hitter. Walking slowly up there toward the plate. Rather disgruntled young man. He himself had the chance to get out of that inning without a run scoring when he had a chance to make a double play there on Dean going to second. But he threw the ball into center field to let the first run of the inning score. And after that, four or three more runs scored, and all four of them were definitely due to errors. And for that reason, there were four unearned runs that inning, which gives the Athletics a 5 to nothing lead. Now the Sox better get going if they're going to get back in this ball game, but they're a hustling group. You can't tell what's liable to happen. They haven't made a hit yet. They've had two men on base, one on an error, one on a base on balls. And here is Kane at that to start the last half of the third inning. And he takes the first one wide across the waist for ball one. Now you're going to get buttered all over a little business, George. One ball call, pitcher again winds up, throws, and it's ball two. It's over the plate for too low, and the count is two and nothing. Two balls and no strikes on King. Boy, you should see me try to talk with popcorn in my mouth. Here comes ball three wide across the knees, and it's three balls and no strikes on King. Three and nothing to count. Walks back on the slab again. He's winding up. Throws in the hitter. Takes ball four. It's over the plate, but too low. And Kane opens the inning with a base on ball. Well, when a pitcher watches, he walks the other pitcher to open an inning. Why, you can't tell what's going to happen. Sometimes that pressure gives all sorts of excitement. time for a moment while the bat boy takes Kane's leather jacket down for him. He pulls it on. It's brisk breeze. It's got the coolness of the lake with it and could very easily take number pitcher's arm out there in it. Now the pitcher is ready again and he's got a pitch to rest. And the ripper takes the first pitch inside across the knees for ball one. One ball called. Balked out there. He started to uh, wind up and stop and then started his pitching motion again without stepping off the rubber. And umpire McGowan called it instantly, even before the two White Sox coaches started to call it. And so Fink is charged with a balk. If that isn't shown in your, I think it is shown in the scoring system, a little BK, capital B, small K in the scorebook. First pitch to next pitch 
to Roger Brother is outside of ball for ball two, making it two and nothing. Two balls and no strikes. Boy, that wind blows the noise of that train over here like it was right across the street. It's three blocks away. <laughs> over east of the park. Two and nothing, and there is a wide one. No touch in the outside corner of a little above the knees for strike one. And it's two balls and one strike on Radcliffe. Two and one to count. River swings the next to drive it out into center field for a good base hit. And the ball goes clear through the center field. It's going clear to the wall. Radcliffe's around first base, around second base, pulling up at third base. And he starts for the plate. The ball is coming in. But Radcliffe scores easily to give the Sox two runs.
And they had a score of 22 to 7. Parmley and Davis worked for the losing cards. The Dodgers starting Mungo and Barry's with Baker pitching in the seventh. First game of the doubleheader in Boston between the Bees and the Pittsburgh Pirates was won by the Bees, 4 to 1. Ian Patton working for the Pirates with Welch pitching in the eighth. Nick Payton and Lopez for the Bees the entire route. In the second game in Boston, Weaver and Patton the battery for the Pirates, the Bees using Smith and Mueller. At the end of the first half of the fifth inning, the Pirates lead the Bees 2 to 1. The warm-up batteries for the St. Louis Cardinal Brooklyn Dodger game earned shot for the cards, Clark for the Dodgers. The American League in Detroit, the New York Yankees lead the Tigers at the end of the second inning, 7 to nothing. In the first game of the doubleheader in Cleveland, the Indians lead the Washington Senators at the end of the eighth inning by a score of 11 to 6. And now back to Comiskey Park and Al Barton. Take it now. Back at the ballpark for the fourth inning, and we come on the air just after one of the most thrilling plays of the year. Radcliffe came tearing across from left field and made a reaching, scooping, one-handed catch of a fly ball out there. And almost bumped into Appling after catching it, but Radcliffe caught that ball reaching out with one hand and uh, just managed to scoop it off the top of the grass on a beautiful play for the first out. Radcliffe also tearing out cross paths with him for just a moment. But everybody seems all right. The old roomies out there are almost collided. So it's one out of the fourth, and Finney, the leadoff man, hits the first pitch and drive to right field. Hot tears over to his left, gets it and throws it on in. Change in lineup as a result of Haas batting for Rosenthal. Puts Haas in right field and moves Previch out to center. Haas got that ball and fell out there for a base hit. He caught it on the hop. So Finney is on first base with one out of the fourth inning. Wally Moses, the center fielder, who's letting that drive get through him, let two runs score that inning. One of them never would have scored, so the Radcliffe run must go as a, an unearned run. And Moses follows the next one into the second deck above him to lift the plate and bounds out and over and finally lands down amongst the box seat holders down near the Sox dugout. And it's one strike. One strike on Moses. One is inside and low for ball one, and the count is one ball and one strike. One and one on Moses. And Wally swings the next one. Benora leaps high into the air, grabs the ball with a hop, steps on first base, and throws the second. And the runner sliding in there is tagged out. Appling almost for good. Stepped on the base and then suddenly realized that he had to tag him then because the runner had already been put out at first. There was no force play possible. So he put the ball on him fast and completed the White Sox third double play in four innings. They'd had four in four innings, except for that error in the third, and they would have been on their way to some sort of a record. As it was, Moses was out. Benora unassisted, and then Benora's throw to Appling at second base. Double finish sliding in for the third out. So it's no run. One hit in the fourth inning for the Athletics. And the score remains 5-2 to in favor of the A's. The White Sox come to bat in the last half of the fourth inning. Just had a little visit during the intermission for scores with Presbyter the Reverend Alphonse Press of Columbia College of Dubuque. And uh, they listen to us out there. And that is the place, if you people don't remember offhand, where Red Faber did his college pitching before he came to the White Sox. So naturally out there, they're very, very loyal White Sox fans. We were all through. I'll be happy to see Father Dress. Hope he'll come back again. He said it was a little breezy up here. He was going down to Sun Myrtle. It's warmer. I don't blame him. Here's Appling and Fett. Start the last half of the fourth inning. And the pitcher out there takes a look around. The boys see that they're all set. Starts to wind up. And throws, and Luke takes a good strike over the heart of the plate about waist high. One strike on Epling. And the pitcher again is winding up. He throws, and Luke swings in upon it out past the pitcher. Second baseman jumps. He got it easily. Throws the first, and Luke is out for the first out of the fourth inning. One out of the fourth inning for the White Sox. And Hayes is at back. up there. She winds 
up and throws and Jackie takes a fast one high and inside for ball one. One ball called. And there's ball two high and wide for the count is two and nothing. Two balls and no strikes on Hayes. Ready again, he's winding up throws, and Jackie takes a strike over the outside corner about knee high, making it two and one. Two balls and one strike on Hayes. Well, Mr. Ben Pomenia remembered it today. He forgot it yesterday, he came in without blowing. And the next pitch is runs the count to three and one. Three balls and one strike on Jackie Hayes. Was a bat for the White Sox with one out of the fourth inning. Throws a gun and it's strike two. It got the outside corner knee high and it's three and two. Hey, his whistle sounds as though he had caught cold or Ron Pattis or something. <laughs> the fog in his throat. Three and two is the count, but she throws a gun and Jackie follows this one back to the screen. It's still three balls and two strikes on Hayes. Three and two. up once more, throws, and Jackie swings in a long drive out the left center. Moses is going back fast, slows up as the wind gets it and holds it up and makes the catch. Throw pretty well back in left center for the second out. That makes it two up in the fourth inning for the White Sox. And Tony Fyatt, the White Sox third baseman, is at bat. Fyatt up there at the plate. Quite a while getting his time. Finally starts his wind up. Throws and the hitter takes it inside across the waist for ball one. One ball called. Winds up again, throws, and the hitter swings a little pop fly out back to second base. And the shortstop is back there following it as the wind blows. It makes the catch nicely, and it's three out. No runs, no hits. In the fourth inning for the White Sox. And the score at the end of the fourth inning still stands 5-2 in favor of the Philadelphia Athletics. From coast to coast, more and more car owners are turning to Marfan. They know that when they want dependable, thorough chassis lubrication, they can find it at any Pensaco service station with Marfan. They save time and money, too, because Texaco Marfac lubrication lasts twice as long as ordinary grease jobs. First man at the of the fifth inning for the athletics. So are you hungry today? I never saw a man eat so much. First you were buttered all over, and now you're red hot, and a piece of cake, and now you're back in the butter all over again. Takes the first one, lays it down there, down over the heart of the plate, about knee high for a strike. One strike on Dean. He throws again, a jump swing, hit a bounder down, and Jackie Hayes gets it, fumbles it, picks it up again, throws it to first, and the runner is out for the first out of the fifth inning. One out of the fifth inning for the athletic, and Buccinelli is at that. Buccinelli up there at the plate. Wide and low for the second ball. For the first ball. Wait a minute, is that the first pick to him? Yeah, ball one. Yeah, that's quite a score. Hit a swing to the next hit. A high fly coming down. Foul back of the plate. Luke Sewell is back. Coming back slowly under it. Has it. And it's two out in the fifth inning. Two out in the fifth inning for the athletic. Bringing Bob Johnson. He is second base from the bat. Johnson up there at the plate. Just 
Winding up now. Throws and the hitter swings hit a ball hard in the right field for a good clean base hit. Line single to right. By Johnson, putting him on first base with two out in the fifth inning. And the next man up there is Higgins. Frank Higgins, known as Pinky Higgins. The A's, the third baseman. Frank's a pretty husky fellow. When he stands there at the plate, he stands there with the bat held way out in front of him, almost stationary and almost straight up in the air, way out in front of him, waiting for that pitcher to pitch. Standing that way now, and he swings hard at the first one to miss a high, slow curve for strike one. One strike to count. He's ready again. Stretches. Over at first base. Throws the rebound to right back at the game. Lucas throws the first, and it's three up. And the score, five to two in favor of the Philadelphia Athletics. As the White Sox come to bat in the last half of the tenth. First White Sox hitter being Kane, the White Sox pitcher. This broadcast, the White Sox Philadelphia game, comes to you direct from Comiskey Park, the home of the White Sox in Chicago, as a presentation of your neighborhood Texaco dealer, distributor of Texaco Fire Chief Gasoline. Broadcast comes with the permission of the White Sox and the Athletics to stimulate interest in our national game and in your own local baseball team. This is WCFL at Chicago. Wait a minute, I said Kane was the first man at bat. It's Sewell, the first man up. Luke Sewell, the first man at bat for the White Sox. The fifth inning, you people who are keeping track on the... Texaco scorebook probably had me caught up on that long ago. Two tosses it to the bat side. He always comes up swinging three. And steps up there to the plate. The umpire takes a moment to dust the plate. Two waits there. His pink looks around the boys. They play a little bit around toward left field. And the pitcher starts his wind up. And throws and Sewell takes a fast strike over the heart of the plate about waist high. One strike to count. He's ready again, winds up once more, pitches, and it's over the plate for two low for ball one, making it one ball and one strike on Luke Sewell. One and one. Then the pitcher throws a slow ball, Luke gets it out to the third baseman. Higgins gets it, throws the first, and Sewell is out for the first out in the fifth inning. Mr. Fink is pitching himself a nice ball. Last two hits, and one of the two runs scored against him is earned, one unearned. Sugar Cane, White Sox pitcher, walking slowly up there to the plate. Finally walks around behind the umpire, takes his place at the plate. Pitcher is winding up, he throws, and it's wide and low for ball one. One ball call. Pitcher again starts to wind up pitches. And it's a strike over the heart of the plate, waist high, making it one and one. One ball and one strike. Throws again, and the hitter swings in, easy bounder out in front of the plate. Hayes, the catcher, goes out, gets it, throws rather badly, but Dean, who to my mind looks like he has the makings of quite a fielding first baseman as well as a good hitter, reached right out in front of the base runner, grabbed the ball, and then got out of the way to prevent a collision on a very nice play. So it's two out of the fifth inning. Two out of the fifth inning for the White Sox and Radcliffe. Rip Radcliffe, leadoff man, left fielder, is at bat. Leans over, gets the sign, winds up, pitches, and Rip takes a wide one across the waist for ball one. One ball called. Again, he's winding up. He throws and Radcliffe takes it inside across the waist for ball two. So it's two and nothing. Two balls and no strikes on the ripper. Two balls and no strikes. He 
Charging up again, throws in the hitter, takes it for a ball wide and low, and it's three and nothing. Three balls and no strikes on Radcliffe. Three and nothing. Throws again, and Rip takes a strike over the part of the plate about knee high, and it's three and one. Three balls and one strike. Throws again, and there's the fourth ball wide across the chest, and Rip gets the base on ball. They put him on first base, two out of the fifth inning, and Mule Hunt is up there at the plate. Hunt at that. So Connie Max only got one, maybe two fellas sitting down there in the bench with him. You in the bullpen, the rest of them on the field. Watching first base, suddenly throws over there. Oh, throw is high, but Dean steps back and takes it. It was just a lob throw. Didn't have much on it, but it wasn't very straight either. Now he pitches, and uh, Hoss got the wide one low for ball one. Five consecutive bad pitches by this fellow. He waits there again. As he signs, takes a look at first base and throws. And it's inside and low for ball two, making it two and nothing, two balls and no strikes on Hoss. Still watching first base throws, and the hitter takes it inside and low for ball three. Oh, well, it really has lost control all of a sudden, hasn't it? That's three and nothing. We bought Radcliffe on four pitches. Now he's got three and nothing on Hoss. Ready again, watches first base, throws and there's ball four, wide and low, and he gets the base on balls also. Hey, the moon on is blowing today. <laughs> went by without blowing a whistle. So the White Sox have runners on first and second with two out in the fifth inning. And Mike Kreenich is up there at the plate, pitcher and catcher, have a little contest out in front of the player, in front of the mound. And the A's have a pitcher starting to warm up again in the right field bullpen. Cellini has taken quite a workout out of the bullpen for Sox this afternoon. Apparently there, he may be either getting ready for tomorrow or be taking a little tutoring for money rule. The first pitch to Kravitz is a bad ball wide for ball one. One ball called. And Mike swings to push the ball through toward right field. He gets past Johnson, goes out there for a base hit. Runner from first half stops at second. And the shortstop, for some reason or other, let the ball get through. But the third baseman, after he deflected it, chased it out and got it before the runners could advance. The throw from right field came right to Newsom. Newsom, for some reason, just, you know, they just tagged it and deflected it and almost rolled to the stand. But Higgins recovered it quickly so the runners couldn't advance. So Kriegert single to right. Scored right fifth, but Haas on second. And so the White Sox still have runners on first and second. Two out, one run home. Zeke Benura is back, scoring out five to three in favor of the Athletics. Benura up there at the plate. And Zeke swings hit a long drive way out to deep right center. Center field is chasing it. Way, way back there. He might get it. He makes a great dive for the ball and hangs on to it on another sensational play. Man, what a play. Moses carrying across into right center as hard as he could go. Suddenly threw himself headlong and caught that ball and landed right on his face and skidded along. But he held on to the ball and his hands were outstretched. So he couldn't possibly have been just trapping it. He really caught it. And it ended the inning on what looked like a hit that was going to at least tie the score because that ball was really hit. And Moses is getting a beautiful hand from the fan as he comes in there after making that great play to end the inning. One run, one hit, two men left on base for the White Sox in the last half of the fifth. And the score is 5-3 to three in favor of the Athletics at the end of the fifth inning. Have you sent in your request card for the 1936 Texaco Baseball Scoreboard book yet? If not, don't put it off. Thousands of baseball fans are already enthusiastically keeping their own play-by-play -play records of these games and having lots of fun doing it. The instructions are easy to follow. In them, Al Totten tells you just how he does it, and there are plenty of blank score sheets for you to use. In addition, in the 
1936 Texaco Baseball Club. Book your fine schedules of all major league games. Data on all players of both the Cubs and Sox. Plenty of other interesting baseball data on both teams. It's easy to get your free copy. Go to any Texaco service station and ask for a request card. Write your name and address on the card, stamp it, and name. Stop at any Texaco service station and get your card in the mail tonight. And now back to Comiskey Park for the continuation of the baseball game brought to you by permission of the Chicago White Sox and the Philadelphia Athletics to stimulate interest in our national game and in your local team. Take it, Hal. Back at the ballpark for the sixth inning. First man at bat. Frank Hayes lines the ball out into left field for a base hit to open the sixth. And he's on first base. Nobody out in the sixth inning. And Newsom, Whitey well, Newsom, the shortstop, is at bat. Ready to pick the first one to with the first base throws, and he bunts the ball, but it's foul to the right of the plate for strike one. Tied a bumper, one foul. One strike on Newsom. He's on first base. Nobody out in the sixth inning. Jackson throws the first, and oh boy, it was a close play, but he got back very close because. Kane made a good throw over there. Which it throws and loose him again, tries to bunt and again it rolls ball. This time though it hung right alongside the line. And Benoit to make sure that it scooped it on more foul so that it couldn't hit something that found fair. Coach over there, Lena Blackburn grabs it, threw it back to Kane. And Hayes goes back to first base. So it's two strikes on Newsom. Two strikes to count. Throws again for the first ball. It's wide and low on the count. It's one ball and two strikes on Newsom. One and two. the next one wide and low on his ball two so it's two balls and two strikes on Newsom two and two to count Newsom suddenly walks out of the box to dry his hands in the dirt up by calls time Whitey gets back up to the plate pitch is ready throws the hitter takes a wide one across the knees for ball three and it's three balls and two strikes on Newsom. Three and two is the count. She's ready again. Throws the runners on the goal. The hitter takes the third strike. And the ball out to second base. Gets the runner out. Apparently, Hayes is taking the ball. Tacked the fellow almost in the face. He managed to miss his face, but tucked him on the shoulder. And it goes as another double play. Newsom is mad and throws the bat on the ground in disgust as he starts back toward the bench, called out on strike. Umpire McGowan turns around and watches him walk off there to make sure he doesn't make any more of a demonstration. But it's another double play for the White Sox, who now have four of them today. They almost had five. Four in six innings. And think the pitcher, Irvin, is up there. Throws the first one and he swings hit a fall down past the first pick. Blackburn, who was standing more or less back, the plate ducked his head and sort of shrunk all up as the ball bounded past him. Not very close. One strike on Fink, and that was two out of the sixth inning for the Athletics. Kane throws again and Fink swings to foul the ball into the stand back at first base. Pretty well back there, back to the aisle. And it's a two strikes on Fink. Two strikes to count. Curveball inside, striking out for the third up. So it's no runs, one hit in the sixth inning for the Athletics. They still lead the White Sox by a score of five and three. Sox come to bat on the last half of the sixth with Luke Appling, their first man at bat. Appling will be the first hitter in the last half of the sixth inning. This is the third time in a row that Luke has come up there to lead off in an inning. Son of Connie and fellow who usually warm 
warms up the pitchers. Catcher by trade, he's old in his playing days. He's warming up the pitcher. I don't know if Earl did any playing to speak of, but he did some work out with Portland, I believe, as did his brother. Umpire calls for the ball, looks it over pretty carefully, finally decides it's all right. Burns walks out and throws it back to Big, so he can continue his warm-up. Gotcha gets up there to the plate. The ball is thrown out to second base. We have Johnson flipping it over to Newsom. Newsom returning at the pitcher. They walk back their positions. Pitcher's on the rubber. And Appling steps up to bat. Appling is done. Start the last half of the sixth inning. Pitcher starts to wind up throws. And the hitter leans back to take a ball inside across the shoulder. One ball called on Appling. She winds up again, pitches, and it's a strike over the heart of the plate, waste time, making it one and one. One ball and one strike on Appling. And Luke watches a slow one curve wide and low for ball two. So it's two balls and one strike on Luke. Two and one. Comes the next pitch and Luke gets the, lets it roll over to the right. Catch it, let it roll to the right, rather. Luke let it go by and it's three and one. Three balls and one strike on Appling. First man at bat in the last half of the sixth inning of the ball game in which the Athletics are leading the White Sox by a score. A uh, five to three. Big throws again, and Luke lets ball four go by wide. It's a base on balls for Appling, putting him on first base with nobody out of the sixth inning. And Jackie Hayes, White Sox second baseman, steps up there at the plate, stops, looks down to Billy Webb to see if he should take this one or hit it the first one. Apparently got his time. Now looks back at the pitcher, and Fink has the sign. There's the stretch. He pitches, and it's a slow curve that gets the outside corner about knee high for strike one. Strike on here. Ready again, watch his first base, and throws, and it's a high one inside for ball one, with one ball and one strike on here. One and one to count. Throws again with Appling on the go. He drives the ball out into left center for a good base hit. A good hit and run play in which he drove the ball right through the spot. The shortstop is vacated to go over there to cover second. A good hit and run play in which Hayes lines the single to left center, moving Appling to third base. Appling on the go. The shortstop dashed over to cover second. And he just pulled that ball right through the spot he left open. So Appling has no trouble reaching third base. He's winding up a pitcher pretty hard in the bullpen. And Tony Fyatt steps up there. Fyatt at bat. He gets ready to watch his first and throws, and Tony swings in a pounder down to the third baseman, and they trap Appling between third and home. Luke runs back there and is out as he flies back in with the third baseman taking a throw from the catch. Play went from Higgins. So he is to Higgins. And Appling is out. These White Sox runners on first and second. So it's the field is choice. Putting Fyatt on first base. And Appling was out. Higgins to Hayes to Higgins. For the first out. That makes it one out in the sixth inning. White Sox runners on first and second. And Luke Sewell is at bat. Watch his second base and pitches, and Luke takes the curve ball wide for ball one. One ball called. On the energy side. Pitches, and Sewell swings in a high fly to right center. Center fielder and right fielder closing in on it. And the right fielder comes through to make the catch for the short fly for an easy out of the second out of the sixth inning. White Sox still have runners on first and second. Two out now in the sixth inning. 
strike on Moses. Two and two. Little youngster went over there and got that ball right off from the grasp of some man who was trying to get it. Two and two now. Two balls and two strikes. Wally swings hit a bounder. Benoit races over to his right. Gets it. Tosses to Kane. But Wally, a very fast man, beats it out easily for a base hit. Ball was really Hayes' ball, but Venura went out to get it, and as a result, they lose that man. It's a base hit for Moses. He's so fast, you can't fool with him. When it comes to a play like that, he's going to beat you. And so Moses is on first base with one out of the seventh inning, and Dean, Chuck Dean, the first baseman, is at bat. Curveball inside and low for ball one. One ball called. It throws again. The runner's on the goal. The hit and run play. The hitter drives the ball in the left field for a base hit. Brad Clippery fields it fast and throws it in to third base, holding the runner from first and second. So it's single to left field by Dean, moving Moses to second base. Well, Dean can really part of that ball. And that puts Philadelphia runners on first and second with one out of the seventh inning. And Puccinelli, the right fielder, is at that. She throws the first one and Pucci to low and high fly away out deep left center. Rackets way back there near the end of the scoreboard. Makes the catch, a runner from second is trying to go to third, and he's making it easily. Oh, my God, that fella can run. He's a streak. It's a long, long fly away out the deep left center, right into the wind, or it would have been into the stands, I believe, with any kind of west wind blowing. It would have been a home run by Puccinelli, as it was. It was caught by Radcliffe. And Moses, a very fast man, easily went to third after the cut. The husky fellow... Ready to pitch the first one to him. Throws. Bob takes a line inside for ball one. One ball call. Ready again. Swings the ball at the plate. Sox and the Athletics to stimulate interest in our national game and in 
and your own local baseball team. This is WCFL in Chicago. Hank is finishing his warm-up. Down here with Hayes while Radcliffe stands there waiting to take his turn to bat.
But right now, he hasn't made a base hit, although he's had a walk. Radcliffe has made two hits besides having a walk. And Ripper is out in front again, although not, I don't think, in front of the league. And the hitter hits one into the second deck, a high fly going into the second deck, and it bounces down and knocks a straw hat right off the man sitting down there in the box seat, and everybody got a laugh out of it, including the fellow who lost the straw hat. Boy, it made a mess of that straw hat, too. <laughs> strikes on Appling. And a pitcher throws again. Loop swings and follows this one into the stand back into the right. So it's still two strikes on Loop. Benur is on second base. One out, two runs home in the seventh inning. White Sox now tied with the Athletics. Five and five. Throws on Luke Swing, hit one down fast. First baseman is going on down the line. Luke makes the turn, but the and keeps right on for second base because the right fielder throws to the plate and pulls in at second base. A single down the right field line by Appling. He goes to second on the throw to the plate as Panura scores. To give the White Sox the lead for the first time this afternoon. White Sox are leading the ball game now by a score of six to five. Hayes to bat. Hayes up there at the plate. With Appling on second base. One out. Three runs home in the seventh inning. And that little Lucius loop came through when it counted, didn't he? And the next first pitch to Jackie is a strike over the inside corner about knee high. One strike on Hayes. Ready out there again, throws, and Jackie swings in another one into right field. Right fielder comes in fast, grabs the ball, holds it for just a moment, then grabs it and throws it to the plate. But the runner scores easily, and it's a base hit with no error. The right fielder couldn't be charged with an error, although he fumbled that ball momentarily after falling to a knee, trying to make a diving shoestring catch. momentarily, but that was because he'd made that great try and was on his knees and couldn't be expected to handle the ball quickly after making that try for the ball. Scores another run, so the Sox now lead 7-5 to five and have Hayes on first base with one out, four runs home. 25 at bat, swings around, tries to hit the first one to right, but he falls it down the right field line and pretty well back into the seat.
for the third out, ending the seventh inning. Not until the White Sox not only had died the score, but gone into a two-run lead. In the last half of the seventh inning, were four runs, one, two, three, four, five hits, one error, and two men left on base. The error did not figure in the scoring. And the score is seven to five in favor of the White Sox. At the end of the seventh inning, don't buy just any old gasoline for your car. Be as smart as the United States government. It buys gasoline on specification. You too can buy the same way. Fill up with Texaco Fire Chief, and you're getting a gasoline which meets the United States government's specifications for emergency motor fuel. And it costs no more than ordinary gasoline. Ready to go in the eighth inning. First man at bat for the athletics is Higgins, the third baseman. Just wind up. Throws and Pinky swings in a long drive up deep left field. Radcliffe chasing over there, but it's foul, I believe. Foul, it hits the railing of the upper deck of the grandstand. Foul by only a few inches, and Higgins has to come back. Oh, that ball was really hit, and the wind was more or less against it rather than blowing it out. Still, it went up into the second deck, hit the railing right in the front of it, and carried downstairs but was fouled by a foot or two, and it's one strike, but a very long strike on Mr. Higgins. Game throws again for strike two, fastball over the inside corner, about knee high, so it's two strikes on Higgins. And White Sox are going to keep a couple pitches warmed up there in case of emergency. Game winds up again, throws the hitter, follows the ball into the stand to the right of the plate. It's still two strikes on Higgins. Certainly somebody caught that ball down there and gets quite a hand from the fans. Here it swings again, hit a high fly. Keyes is coming over back of it, waving Appling away, but suddenly Appling calls for it and follows it on into the infield in front of second base and makes the catch for the first out of the eighth inning. Inning for the athletic, and Frank Hayes, the catcher, is at bat. Kane starts to wind up, throws, and the hitter takes the ball. It's over the plate, but it's too low. One ball called. Goes again, the hitter swings a high fly going foul into the stands back at first base. And makes it one and one. One and one, but she throws again, and the hitter swings hit a bounder down to Fyatt. He fights it a little bit, fumbles it momentarily, then throws the first, and a beautiful play by Benora. Got Leaped out, caught the ball one-handed, and then kicked back to get the bag just before the runner got there, and it's two out of the eighth inning. Very nice play by Big Zeke. So it makes it two out of the eighth inning for the athletic, and Newsom, Whitey Newsom, the shortstop, is at best. Kane throws the first one, and Whitey takes the curve ball wide and low for ball one. Pitcher on the slab is ready once more. He's winding up. Pitch is and the hitter started to swing, but changed his mind and took a ball wide. And so it's two and a few balls and no strikes on Newsom. Who had nothing with the pitcher ready again. Winds up, throws, and it's a strike. A pass ball over the heart of the plate, making it two and one. One of those wandering clouds suddenly blew across below the sun and it 
Got the field completely in shadow, but all around us the sun is shining. Hitter hits the next one, a grass cutter out past the pitcher. Hayes got to throw the first, and it's three out in the eighth inning, although Hayes' throw is a little wide, but it'll reach way out to get. Three out in the eighth inning for the athletic. And the score is still 7-5 to five in favor of the White Sox. White Sox coming to battle the last half of the eighth with Rip Radcliffe, the leadoff man again, the first man up. Let's see if we have a change out here. Number 20, Jumpert, G-U-M-P-E-R-T, is the new pitcher for the athletic.
Okay. Just stop in at any Texaco station, ask for a request card, fill it out, put a stamp on it, and mail it. It's already addressed to me, and you'll get your score. Hemic batting for comfort. Take the first pitch high and inside for ball one. A strike over the outside corner, so it's one and one. She winds up once more, throws, and there's ball two. It's inside and low. Swings the next in a high fly, coming down foul back to plate. Sewell is jogging back with umpire McGowan running right with him. Luke grabs it, hangs on to it. And it's one out of the ninth inning. Luke's caught himself a lot of foul balls down there today at that, hasn't he? Well, that makes it one out of the ninth inning for the Athletics. And the next man up there is Lou Finney, the leadoff man in left field. Throws the first one, he swings, hit a bounder down to Jackie Hayes. Jackie soaks it up, throws the first, and the runner is out for the second out of the ninth inning. Two out of the ninth inning for the Athletics. And Moses, the A's center fielder, is at bat. Moses, another left-handed hitter, waits there as Kane starts to wind up, throws. And it's a wide one across the knees for ball one. One ball called. Should has the sign again, start to wind up. Pitches, and the hitter tried to get away from that one, but it came into him and hit the handle of the bat and found the ball back to the stand. So it's one and one. One ball and one strike on Moses. Waiting there again for the sign. Suddenly the umpire calls time, walks up, talks to Sewell about something or other. Oh, he changed that last one to a ball? How could he have hit the bat? Well, he did, so it's two and nothing. There must be some reason. It might have hit Sewell's glove or something first and turn down against the bat. Anyway, the next one does come over the plate for a strike, and it's two and one. Two balls and one strike. And there's ball three, wide and low. And it's three and one. Three balls and one strike on Moses. And is winding up again. He throws and the hitter takes a strike over the inside corner about knee high. It runs the count to three and two. Now we'll see what happens. Balls and two strikes on Moses. Throws and bounds. Well, he swings the ball one way down the left field line, back underneath the second deck, far down beyond third base. And it's three and two. Three balls and two strikes. Winding up again, throws and the hitter takes ball four, high and wide, and gets the base on ball. Well, that puts Moses on first base and two out in the ninth inning. And right very troublesome young man with that up there to the plate. He really looks like a lot of hitters. He stands there looking at the bench. Oh, the umpire discovered the catcher's paraphernalia lying out there on the ground. It's from the dugout. It's supposed to be in it. So they wait until it's taken in. And there's the first pitch to Dean for a slow curve. It comes over the heart of the plate around the knees for a strike. One strike on Dean. Throws again, and the hitter swings at a foul down the left field line, clear over the roof of the sand, and it's two strikes on Chubb. Two strikes count. Waiting for that next one. It's ready again. Throws, and the hitter takes a high one wide for ball one, and it's one ball and two strikes. On deep. Moses on first base, two out of the ninth inning, and the White Sox leading seven to five. Again, Kane pitches in the hitter, swings in a high fly to center field. Kivich is coming in fast. Finally slows up on 
Hendrick has it, and it's three out of the Sox win the ball game. Boy, that score, seven to five. In the ninth inning, no run, no hit, one man left on beat. And the final score of the total, White Sox had seven runs, ten hits, three errors, and eight men left on the bases. The A's had five runs, ten hits, three errors, and they had uh, seven men left on the bases. Time of the game, one hour and 53 minutes. 153. The winning pitcher, of course, was Kane. And the losing pitcher was Fink. The summaries again. White Sox had seven runs, ten hits, three errors, with eight men left on base. The Athletics, five runs, ten hits, three errors, and seven men left on base. Time of the game, an hour and 53 minutes. The winning pitcher, Kane, the losing pitcher, Fink. Tomorrow, the White Sox and Athletics play the final game of this series. And then on Friday, the Boston Red Sox come to town. And Friday is Ladies' Day. Ladies admitted without tickets. All they got to do is get that tax ticket that the government requires. It's a doubleheader Sunday between the White Sox and Red Sox here at Comiskey Park. And we'll be seeing you a lot the rest of the week, won't we? That's all for now. So Hal Todd speaks for George as well as himself. It's a good afternoon from Comiskey Park, and we return to the studio. Goodbye now. Now stands two wins for the White Sox and one for the Athletics. Now stands two wins for the White Sox. Ted Lyons may be nominated to go into action against the Athletics. And Connie Mack's pitching selection is full so mystery because Connie rotates with Harris as he sees fit. The time of the game, one hour and 54 minutes. Seven to five, Chicago coming from behind with a four-run rally in the last half of the seventh inning to show up the ball game. That's all for today, ladies and gentlemen, for Philip 66. Don't forget to tune in this evening at 8 o'clock for the March of Sports. So now, this is Russ Hodges speaking for the ballpark, and I'll be seeing all right, thank you, Russ. There's no question about it. All gasolines, or nearly all of them, are better than they used to be. They've all been improved, stepped up, made pure, and freed from knots. But only Phillips offers you at all its stations the benefits of the new scientific polymerization process. Every gallon of Phillips 66 polygas is enriched with the resulting extra energy units. You notice the difference the first time you try a tank full. Your motor runs sweeter, quieter, smoother, and cooler with extra power and extra mileage. And the big news is that you don't have to buy a single penny extra for this wonderful new hot weather gasoline. For just the price of ordinary motor fuel, buy Phillips 66 poly gas. Phillips 66 has brought you the baseball game by permission of the Chicago White Sox and the Philadelphia Athletics to stimulate interest in our national game and in your local team no matter where you may be. Don't forget, the Phillips Petroleum Company will present Russ Hodges again tomorrow in the broadcast of another baseball game from Comiskey Park. Be sure to listen in tonight at 7 o'clock for the reenactment of today's Cubs game, Dramatized. W-I-N-D and Gary, the tip-top spot on your dial. The game between the Boston Red Sox and St. Louis Browns has just concluded the third inning. The score, Boston 1, St. Louis 5. Boston using Oscar Mueller as the pitcher and Bird the catcher. St. Louis hogs it the pitcher and Giuliani the catcher. Going into the last half of the seventh inning at Detroit, the New York Yankees 13, Detroit Tigers 1. The batteries in the game for New York, roughing the pitcher, Dickey the catcher. For Detroit, Sullivan, Hawker, and Kinsey all doing the pitching, and Myatt the catcher. While we wait for the rest of the scores, let me tell you ladies of the wonderful opportunity that's awaiting you at New Art. You can actually get the smart new dresses you need, fresh, clean socks that will carry you through the rest of the summer in beauty and comfort at a low sale price right now when you need them most. Values to $8.95. Satins, shears, nets, crepes, every fabric that's popular in white, pastel shades, print, and even some new black. And they're just $2.95 on terms of 25 cents down and 25 cents a week without interest or carrying charge. Go to New Arts and see these extraordinary values for yourself. 
there's a complete selection in your size. And New Art's courteous clerks are truly eager to help you. Number 25 cents down, and no red tape or fuss at all to take your choice right home with you. It's New Art, 232 South State Street, and 6319 South Halsted Street. Now here come the scores in the National League. At Boston, the end of the first game of a doubleheader, the Pittsburgh Pirates, one run, nine hits, and two errors. Boston, four runs, ten hits, and three errors. Boston, four, Pittsburgh, one. The batteries for Pittsburgh, Swift, Welch, the pitcher, and Pat in the catcher. For Boston, McFade in the pitcher, and Lopez, the catcher. A final score of the second game that has just come in. Pittsburgh, 10 runs, 16 hits, and 1 error. Boston, 4 runs, 9 hits, and 2 errors. Pittsburgh, 10. Boston, 4. The batteries in the game. For Pittsburgh, Weaver and Brown, the pitchers. Padden and Finney, the catchers. For Boston, Smith and Wright, the pitchers. And Mueller, the catcher. The final score of the first game of the doubleheader between the St. Louis Cardinals and Brooklyn Dodgers. St. Louis, 7, and the Brooklyn Dodgers, 22. The total, St. Louis, 7 runs, 7 hits, and 3 errors. The Brooklyn Dodgers, 22 runs, 21 hits, and 1 error. The batteries in the game for St. Louis, Parma Lee and Davis. For Brooklyn, Van Lingle Mungo, the pitcher, and Barrett, the catcher. At the end of the fourth inning of the second game, the St. Louis Cardinals 5, Brooklyn Dodgers nothing. The batteries working that game for St. Louis, Big George Earnshaw, the pitcher, and Ogbedowski, the catcher. For Brooklyn, Park and Butcher, the pitcher, and Self doing the backstopping. The doubleheader between the Cincinnati Reds and the Philadelphia Phillies was called because of wet ground, being able to play neither of the two game schedules. The final score between the Chicago Cubs and the New York Giants played at New York. Chicago 2, New York Giants 7. The total, Chicago 2 runs, 8 hits, and 2 errors. The New York Giants 7 runs, 12 hits, and 1 error. The batteries for Chicago. Big Bill Lee started, Bryant relieved, and Root relieved Bryant. Three pitchers, Lee Bryant and Root, and Gabby Hardness behind the plate. For New York, Gabler the pitcher, and Gus Mancuso the catcher. Fellows, you don't know what real comfort is until you've worn one of the smart new summer suits that New Arts are featuring. Nationally advertised, genuine loom cool and beach weave masterpieces in single and double breasted models. Porous, lightweight suits that let the air circulate close to your body are priced just $12.50. And all you need is 50 cents down to take your suit home with you. 50 cents a week will take care of the balance, and at New Arts, there's never any interest or carrying charge. And while you're there, don't fail to see the smart accessories on display. Shirts and ties, polo shirts, white vinyl trousers, white shoes, all at the Loop Store. Get everything you need at New Arts on easy credit. Go to New Arts, N-E-W-A-R-T, New Arts, 232 South State Street and 6319 South Halstead Street. Open Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday evening. Listen tomorrow right after the game for scores of other games presented by New Arts, Chicago's favorite family credit closures. W-I-N-D.